following interview was conducted with Ted Wolf for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on July 30th, 2013 at the Humanities Library. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Joining us is graduate assistant Renee Gardner. Welcome. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what life was like as a youngster? Well, I was born, raised in Attica, Indiana. I was born in 1948. Uh, typical childhood, play baseball, basketball, ride your bicycle. We didn't have public swimming pools at the time when I was little, so you'd sneak off and go to the creek or something like that. But uh, Little League summers, no, I grew up in town. But uh, the summers were just back then. I mean, you found something to do because you didn't get in trouble because you had to go home to mom and dad and they put the board on the bottom if you needed it. <laughs> well. <Yeah. laughs> and how old were you when you came to Purdue? Uh, Age-wise, I don't really remember. I started August the 5th of uh, 1985 with no intentions of ever staying. Is that right? It, uh, I worked at a steel mill in Attica, Harrison Steel, for 16 years. They let a lot of us go, and which I was one. I had a couple friends that uh, owned their own construction companies. I worked part-time here or there with them, and I got a call from a guy at Purdue by the name of Bob Pepler. He wanted to interview me. I come up started $7.40 an hour, and I sat three hours in an interview with this guy. It was laid back back then. I mean, you know, they still smoked in the building. He, uh, no-nonsense no type guy, but... That's a three-hour interview. Yeah, though. but I kept wondering why, why, why? Well, as it went on, I was kind of seeing what was happening during the summer months. I had worked with his father. They were born and raised in Fountain County where I grew up. So I knew his dad and his brothers, but I never did know Bob the guy was interviewing me. So we just get telling war stories about his dad, his brother, and my on the job training at Harrison Steel and you know, he let him up a cigar just like it was yesterday's feet up on the desk and and I told him, I said, I just want to work through the winter. He was comfortable with it. Well, come summertime you know, can you maybe help me out in summer? Well, yeah, I will. One year led to 25. Wow. And uh, it started, you know, like I say, through Bob with no intentions and I have no regrets. I, if I could have done it all over again, I'd have come here right out of high school. Huh. And, uh, but Harrison Steel taught me some really good trades, which were beneficial to my job at Purdue. And I, uh, like I say, I just never really had any regrets about it. Uh, the raises were good for me. Everything that that I got, I mean, it feels like it wasn't given to me. I worked for it, but it uh, it worked out real well. So when you started, and you started at Windsor Hall? I started at Windsor Hall. And what were the first kinds of things that you did starting out? Uh, well, the first three or four days was just trying to learn the five buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back, I know what you mean. Back yeah. then, uh, we did it all through uh, work orders from like your, back then they had staff residents and your floor counselors and they would submit forms by paper then you know they'd just delegate them out to who go do it. Well, it was just basic uh, electrical plumbing, carpentry work and I thought well you know, I mean it's everything I did my whole life anyhow because I'm pretty mechanically inclined and a couple times I got up on the floor and got turned around but once I could find an exit, you know, I could look around and see where it's going. But after, after about the first two or three weeks, I felt real comfortable. I mean, of being able to go uh, in the buildings, uh, this and that. Took a while to get to know some of the kids and this and that, you know. But like I say, it was it was fun. Nice. Well, speaking of the kids, what was your relationship with the students like? Well. I feel like it was very well. Uh, I I think when when I first started Windsor, of course, fourth floors were all full. We was maybe in the 760 some odd capacity. Uh, 
I tried to call every kid by their first name if I could. If I couldn't remember your name, I gave you a nickname. But then, but uh, I got along with all of them. I don't recall of ever having a run-in. I had a couple students that I didn't feel comfortable around. Uh, but other than that, I knew how to handle that situation oh. too. But I mean, you just never put yourself in a situation where I was uneasy or make the student uneasy. But 99% of them in my 25 years, uh, they'd come up, hey Ted, I need a hug. Wow. You know, and or something like this. But I got to know a lot of the kids. Uh, I've taken a lot of them to dinner. Uh, a lot of them has been to the house. Uh, I have one student that lives triflis. She's over in Ohio, which she's now married. Uh, I think her last name is Dragger, Liz Dragger. Uh, married husband, Ed. I have one daughter, Sammy, but I talk to her every, every year, uh, usually the first Friday in November. Of course, that's the start of deer season in, in <laughs> oh. Indiana. So that's just how we kind of do it. Uh, Melissa Schroeder, she's in California, pharmacy major. Uh, she's been to the house. We've been to dinner several times. She now has children. Uh, but you know, a lot of the kids still get Christmas cards from. I see uh, a lot of the kids. I come up for the rededication. Kind of made me feel old because here come the <laughs> girls I still knew that had two and three kids yeah. and uh, things like that. But I mean, if if they put as much, if I put as much impact on their life as they did mine, I, I was a success. Because I mean, I I I enjoyed coming to work. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, if you didn't see them for one or two days, you wonder why. Uh -huh. But I visited every day. I mean, I had my my rounds. I mean, I was up and down the hallway at least three or four times a day. You know, if they needed something, they'd holler. They could tell by my keys are jingling when oh, I was yeah. going down the hall. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was fun. Huh. Did other did other staff members have that sort of closeness with the students, or are you just particularly when, at home? When I started there, there was a fellow there. I won't mention his name, but he uh, had been there like 33 years. I think he was burnt out on the job, but working in an all girls dorm, I wanted to get to know the kids because like I say after my first year I liked it the insurance was great mm -hmm. the money was great and with 768 girls and me I wanted to make sure that we were on the side that I knew them they knew me and uh, oh they, they've they've asked me questions they've told me stories, they've pulled jokes on me oh, as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, I could take it as well as I could put it out. Uh, one girl from Huntington, her last name is Wolf as well, no relation, and her and her mother come back to the uh, rededication of Windsor and it was kind of funny because Allison, that's the student to come here, she come in as a freshman and I was up at the main counter in Wood Hall there and she said, I'm here to check in. And they said, what's your last name? She said, Wolf. And I said, hey, Wolf kid, I'm a wolf man. We just started from day one there. You know, she comes down quite often, but when Allison and Emily, her mother, come back to the rededication, we was having brunch there at Windsor. I got telling them some stories. And I said, Emily, and I said, I used to have a student come through the front door of Warren Hall and just throw her key, said, tell Ted to park my car. Oh. <laughs> I'd go park her car because she'd be your <laughs> Emily says, well, who would that be? And I said, your daughter. <laughs> but you know, that's, back then we did that. I mean, if they had a flat tire, we changed a flat tire, we didn't care. And, uh, but yes, I probably let them take advantage of me to a certain <laughs> degree, but you know, if they're pushing customer, these are our customers on you. Well, these are my customers, and they were good to me. So, you know, and, you know, most girls can't change tire anyhow. It must have meant a lot to them to have someone around like that. Well, you know, I, I've i told a lot, a lot of people that I never was the father of any girls, but I felt like I was the father of 760 girls for 25 years. And, uh, I mean, 
the stories can just go on forever. Uh, my mother, uh, this is probably back in the early 90s when WRH Club used to sell sweatshirts, different themes on them, whole nine yards. Well, had a little girl that lived over in Demi, and there four years, and I never did know her name other than no shoes. Because <laughs> when she'd come through the tunnel, she had no shoes on. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I'd buy these sweatshirts each year from my mother, and uh, in Park County, which is south of where I grew up, is uh, they have the Covered Bridge Festival in the fall. So my mother's down there wearing one of these WRH Windsor Resident Hall sweatshirts. This girl comes up and says to her, says, you work at Windsor Hall? I said, no, I said, my son does. I said, well, what's his name? She said, and she said, well, it's Ted Wolf. She kind of looks, says, he got a mustache? I said, oh, yeah. I said, you tell him no shoes, said hi. Well, you know, that's, that was, and that made my mother's day. Yeah. But you never know. I used to go to basketball games, and uh, the kids would run into us, and they'd come over and talk. But, you know, it's, uh, wow. I was just their dad for nine months out of the year. I mean, if they needed something, I did it. And I've talked to the parents on the phone and, uh, but one thing I never did do, and I had people ask me, well, how's my daughter doing this and that? And I said, I really don't know. Everything in her room that I'm responsible for is repaired. And that's all mm -hmm. I can tell you. Cause you know, I would never, even if they were getting in trouble in the wrong way, I'd never I'd tell on them. Uh, I'd try to, straighten them out the right way, which I thought should be done to keep anybody from getting hurt. But if it uh, involved drugs or maybe a gun, I might have said something to the counselor, but most generally we could work it out. Uh -huh. And uh, But they had a lot of trust in me, I think. Wow. I really do believe they did. Can you tell us about some of those jokes that they played on you? <laughs> Well, a lot of people probably won't want to hear them, but I'll tell them <laughs> since you asked. But uh, in Warren Hall a few years ago, well, see, when Warren, when I first started there, all the windows were open to the outside. And if the students was gone, the wind would whip them, and you'd have to go up and put them back on track, re-glass them, and on and on and on and on and on. Well, on second floors during Grand Prix weekend, there's a dormer there curtains were pulled out of the wall and this and that and had to put them back up and I went up there they said oh Ted said we don't need them done I said well I'm here might as well put them up well there this whole dormer was iced down with their party for the weekend was what iced down with their beer and everything for their party <laughs> but it was Hi. it was big time back then years ago I never said a thing huh? never told on any of them <laughs> just be careful but uh, I've been called to the rooms one year, uh, a girl from Terre Haute named Thumper. Can't tell your first name, but, but she was Thumper, because she always acted tough to everybody, oh. you know. <laughs> but uh, she called and wanted me to come up to her room. I said, well, do I need tools? No, just come up. So I went up, there was a chair set in the middle of the floor. I said, sit down. I said, no, I'm not doing that, sit down. So I let them talk to me and sat down, and they made me close my eyes. They gave me $20 worth of, I think back then it was $20 in Pizza Hut gift certificates <laughs> and a case of beer. So now figure out how to get it out of the hall. But you know, just things like that. And, awesome. and after, after I left, I would tell, I can always tell my wife the stories, but them kids, they, uh, they were neat. And anybody thinks that girls can't come up with things that guys can they're wrong but we didn't have the damage out of the girls if we had damage that was done in the building it was usually done by an irate boyfriend or something like that you know and but the kids would tell me they wouldn't lie to me uh -huh. you could almost tell if something was missing in the hall it was never stolen in my books it was always just borrowed uh, which would be maybe a chair from the rec room or something like that. And all I'd have to do is go talk to five or six kids in the hall. Sure enough, two hours later, it'd be back. You know, it wouldn't be a hall charge, uh -huh. but uh, just things like that. And, and they would uh, try to scare me, which they could do that quite often. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was part of why I think we got along so good. They scared you like 
just jump out of their room and, and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm a little jumpy to begin with, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. Huh. Wouldn't have had it any other way. What did you find most challenging and most rewarding during your time? Uh, probably the most challenging that a part of my job was doing what the administration wanted me to do. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of things that the way they wanted, I didn't think needed to be done that way. Uh, then I got in with some uh, situations uh, back then. I don't know what it would be called today, but used to you uh, would see a sign like maybe no men allowed in this room. I didn't know if that was just a sign the kids were hanging up but after doing some checking there were situations that i don't know if it's religion who what when or where but you weren't allowed in their room so you would schedule when you could be there with somebody or vice versa mm -hmm. but that was a real challenge because like i say i if i seen a sign it meant nothing to me you don't know, knock on the door highest ted maintenance if you're not there i would key and go do whatever i had to do lock your door and leave but that was makes it weird yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then most rewarding uh, every day was a reward yeah. to me Can't I mean uh, I just have so many good memories about it uh, that not very many bad ones I was in a situation one time with a mother father their daughter was killed on the way home to Christmas and I was told to go let him in the room, which I didn't realize what had happened, and that was a toughie. But, you know, you, I, I got attached to the kids. I mean, I, I got to a place I couldn't even hardly tell them goodbye without getting a lump in my throat, and that's that's too bad. I mean, you know, but I always I was glad to see the kids do good. A lot of them got really good degrees. A lot of them done nothing with their degrees, but they still have it. They've always got something to fall back on. Uh, <clears throat> But I don't know, I mean, that was probably about as good a reward as I had. Just just knowing that they, they trusted me, they liked me, you know, or even if they didn't, I believe that they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what about changes over time? Over the 25 years that you were here, what well, were the big changes that happened? I've been through three presidents Why I was here. I was through one, two, I think three hall managers, three facilitators. Probably the the biggest changes, and I'm just going to talk about Windsor Hall, was the remodeling of the buildings uh, when they started building the dining court. I was kind of opposed to that in a way because I thought Windsor Hall is a unique building. I mean, it's just so much character to it. And when I started there, we had five buildings, which you had five kitchens. And you ate in the kitchen that the hall that you lived in and on and on and on and on. Well, a lot of kids couldn't make it back from class to get to lunch or whatever. So, you know, that was really kind of expensive for the parents. So then they decided, okay, we're gonna phase out three and we'll go to just two common kitchens, which they had worn and bought her, which actually the worn dining room and the water dining room are actually the original floors that were there. And, but when they come in and put the dining court in, so uh, everybody could eat here or there, I, I just think, how are they gonna do this? Cause we're gonna take too much character away from the building. And you actually practically had to solve the building in half. Mm -hmm and come right straight up and it was hard to visualize what it was going to look like when it was done but when it was done it was uh, just absolutely beautiful when Wendy Thomas Dolick was my uh, she was a hall manager at the time and I think Ford was built and there was another one but but I made a comment to her I said well you know Ford's just dining court just like a Ford car but I said when they built Windsor Hall you got a Cadillac but it just I mean the wood everything come together uh, it took a long time for me to accept that then they started 
renovating the buildings. Mm -hmm. Some of the craftsmanship in there, absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it got covered up. I was opposed to that. Uh, I, you took it away from a, a building, I guess, that had character, uh, but when the old buildings were there, it was just like, I mean, if you went down the hallway, the doors was open, they'd speak to you, hey, or blah, blah, blah. Uh, now, he goes up there and it's just, to me, it's too narrow, ceilings are too low. Uh, it's, I don't know, I just didn't really care for the looks of it, but I realized, you know, that it's, in order to be competitive, they needed the chilled water. Of course, we was on steam heat and, and it was either hot or cold. Mm -hmm. And no one, no kid that come there had steam heat at home, so, and it was hard to control, but when they went to the chilled water, which the air conditioning and uh, your hot water heat, which everybody, you know, nowadays they want all these uh, things, but we lost a lot of money uh, through conferences and stuff like this so that, you know, we just couldn't, they couldn't rent them on account of, you know, we didn't have the air conditioning and that was part of why they done it was to generate money and, uh, but as far as the buildings go, they are, they haven't really changed on the outside, the looks of it, it's just the inside. Uh, I always enjoyed the cold molding that was plaster. I never could duplicate it, but I tried a hundred different oh, times. Yeah. Yeah. But it, just the craftsmanship in there, but, uh, the doors, there used to be doors in, in uh, Windsor Hall, uh, 402 Warren Hall, and found this here when <clears throat> we were putting new floor tile, because back then they were asbestos, they had to all come out and do this and that. But there was a door up there that the girls had lived in that from way back in like the 50s, they'd write their name on the top of the door, you're the graduate, and come floor down the side. Well, and I showed that to some of the girls up there. One of them was that lived there was from Fountain County. Well, they'd all add to it. Well, this was kind of neat to me, and I'd just go tell the kid, you know, when you graduate, put your name on the door. And well, see, that was all done, which to me should have been left there because it was character to me. But a lot of people didn't look at it like I looked at it. I mean, I can take an old piece of furniture that's been broken two or three times and call it a treasure. It doesn't have to be brand new to me. Yeah doesn't have to be brand new. Huh. So during that renovation, did you did you help out with that? I did the, about the only thing that I was involved is in the renovation was I set in uh, about every meeting there was with the architects uh, through this and through that, helping to locate uh, the access to this, the access mm -hmm. to that. I. I knew the buildings real well from top to bottom. Uh, I did set in on many of the construction meetings during their progress meetings, but if my boss, my supervisor, Phil Andrew, was gone, yes, I would go with Wendy. Uh, but biggest part of it was done by contractors. Uh, a lot of the things that we didn't like or care for, we could maybe get changed. Uh, I'll give you an example on the fourth floor landing in Warren Hall was a light that hung out over the stairway, mm -hmm. but it was right straight down. No way you could get a ladder to it mm -hmm. to change the light bulb. So I would stand on a ladder on the deck, put my foot out on the mm -hmm. railing and my hand on the ceiling and reach oh, out to get it. Wow. Well, see, we, when I do this, nobody would be around because, you know, but anyway, I'd change the light bulb. Mel, I can't tell you Mel's last name for Scholar, uh, architectural firm, he was their electrical contractor. That's the first thing I showed him. I said, Mel, whatever you do, move this light back over here because the stairs aren't. But you know, just little things like that we was involved in. Uh, when the dining court was built, uh, D.A. Dodd was mechanical contractor. I went down there and the first thing I did was I got to know the contractors, who was pushing what. If you was an electrical foreman, I wanted to know you. Because my belief was, if you have to ask me a question, I'm gonna have to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So if I wasn't busy working in a student room or somewhere, I was down there with mm -hmm. a hard hat nosing around, because I wanted to know 
who, what, when, and where, because I was in a learning curve, learning a whole new system, a whole new building, and more or less, you know, but uh, you're just using our structure. But that uh, was part of it that uh, I guess you'd say I was involved in that way, more so I did it because I wanted to, I didn't do it because I had to. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you know, if a person asks me a question, I like to have an answer. And then, well, you mentioned the changes of the Purdue president's been through three Purdue presidents. How does that affect your job? Uh, it didn't affect my job in any way, in their uh, shape, or form. Uh, uh, when Stephen Burring was here, I think I seen him probably one time. Uh, when Martin Jiski was here. He said about uh, three rows in front of us at the basketball game, he just seemed like he was working 24-7, wasn't very friendly unless he was <clears throat> with somebody or, you know, trying to promote. Mm -hmm. uh, Corvida, I seen her at football games, uh, never spoke to her, but I seen her because I always knew Harold Adams, the guy that was her bodyguard, supposedly oh, really? they call, oh yeah, yeah, I knew Harold for a long time, but. It, uh, but, uh, you know, things like that. Probably the closest to a president, I mean, I guess be a vice president, and this, of course, is coming back to housing and food service, was John Sauter. Now, there, there's a man right there that was a class act. Do you, do you, who is he? John Sauter, mm -hmm. he was uh, vice president of housing and food service, oh, okay. and I think he's down at Dalk now. He hit that mandatory age where he had to retire, I believe. So now that's the past he is, the yeah. vice president yeah. of food yeah. services. Yeah, okay. but uh, I remember when John moved his daughter into uh, Windsor Hall, Emily. She was on the third floor, I believe. I could walk to the room, but I can't remember the number now. But Marvis Bosher was the hall manager. And, you know, it was kind of neat the way John done this, but he, he walked in that day and he asked what the procedure. Now, here's the guy who's the vice president of housing and food service asking a hall manager that actually he's their boss. What's the procedure? And Marvis told him. And she said, well, she, you know what John said? He said, I'm here with John Sauter, the father today. He left his watch, got her room key, and we moved his daughter in. But I thought that's kind of cool, you know. I mean, he had the clout to say, "Well, yeah. I'm going to do this." But no, he he just kind of was John Sauter, the father, and it was you know kind of neat. I always remembered that there. Mm -hmm. uh, I know nothing about the new president today. Uh, I think a lot of people were running scared of him when. I was getting ready to retire. Uh, I guess I just really don't have a comment on him because I don't really know. I'm, I'm not here. I'm just on the outside, you know, seeing and hearing what you can read in the paper. Uh, so I guess you have to give him a chance. Yeah. What about special events or programs that took place over the years? Well, they used to have the Winter Whispers dance uh, which was quite a deal. They'd prepare steaks and shrimp and all the girls get all dressed up. We'd set up for them, uh, stuff like that. Uh, they used to do the shorty rush back in, I think, December, the coldest time of the year, uh, which we weren't really involved in that other than making sure that everything was up and running for the kids over Christmas break that was coming back early. Uh, used to do a lot of the uh, uh, programs for their, I think the, I can't remember what to call them. I know the Inez Cannon Awards, we used to set up for that. Uh, a lot of the other stuff, but it, it, it just involved uh, like I say, setting up chairs, making it uh, look good uh, for the students of the evening. But the thing that I liked the most of setting up was Christmas time, which boy, was kind of a pet peeve to me that out of the five buildings, each we all had Christmas trees. We had five working fireplaces. 
we'd set the Christmas trees up, counselors would order a fire, we'd leave them firewood and open damper in the fireplaces, get it all ready, they'd just light it and they'd do s'mores and decorate the tree. Well, see, they took the Christmas trees away and that upset me. Really? Yeah, you couldn't do Christmas anymore. It had to be holiday because I'm stepping on other people's toes. And see, that, that took away the character to me because, I mean, it was a big deal, you know, to go set them Christmas trees up. You just set up an old green Christmas tree and come back next day. You never knew how it was going to be decorated, but mm -hmm. the kids all liked that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bonfires and the fireplaces. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about that winter whisper stance? That changed all over time? I don't even know that the whole had it probably the last five or ten years. Uh, I think a lot of things was moved out there to the union. Uh, I remember when we did a lot of cleaning out, especially when we was uh, emptying the buildings during renovations, finding cases of the old winter whispers glasses with the dates on them. Uh, I don't know what years they quit in. Uh, I had two nieces that lived in Sheely Hall during their time, and they were here during that uh, during the dances, but I can't even tell you what years they were they were here. Hmm. And then you mentioned the sorority rush. Do you see how being involved in these organizations affected students? No, nah, not really. I mean, I was just there, like say more or less to. The only thing I was involved in the dance and the sororities was making sure that when they come back that the showers were all in operation and everything else that they needed. I mean, I might have had one girl on one floor, but still, they needed everything here, here, and here. So that was about all I was involved in. Uh, you know, like I say, it was just uh, setting up the chairs. Uh, they wouldn't let me do no cook, and I wouldn't mind doing that there. But <laughs> I. Uh, but it, like I said, it was just it was part of the job. You, know, I mean, I got a place that you could leave me alone, and if you tell me what was going to happen, I knew I could tell you how to set the chairs. Even today, I bet you I can go over to any one of them living rooms, and they'll say, of course they probably moved a lot of the panels, but you start with five here, you start with five here, you put your. They always said, put the podium up. It's a lecture. It's not a podium. Oh. Podium you stand on. Uh -huh. Lectern you talk to. <laughs> and and, I, and you know, try to get a straight uh, aisle way. Try to keep all your stairs lined up the same way. But you know, you you didn't need any any supervision because I'd done it enough that mm -hmm. and so you'd get up and we'd get to arguing, I'm telling you, over this, over that. <laughs> you know, it's not my first rabbit season, kids. <laughs> yeah. But we used to make a big deal out of it, but uh the uh, we used to have a lot of conferences, uh, church groups, uh, elderly years ago. And, uh, I think it was Presbyterians. We do a lot of setup for them. Uh, wasn't anything special, but you know, like maybe could you find a table so we could pay bridge tonight mm -hmm. and stuff like that, you know, but. That was rewarding because I got to see somebody or somebody new. A lot of times the people would come back. We'd have a band day or 4-H and the kids, you'd, you'd see the same ones, the same uh, conductor, Carl and the rest of them, you know, you see them year after year after, you know, they come up and call you by name. They just come up and ask for you. You know, where's Ted? We were, you, were you the only maintenance? No, there was a uh, there was two other guys there. Uh, <clears throat> I worked with a guy the name of uh, Nick Westerberg, Carl Nick Westerberg, and uh, him and I, we, we done a lot for the kids. We, uh, if they needed a loft, back then you could build your own loft instead of renting from the hall, and Nick was a good carpenter. If they needed a loft, we had spare lumber, we'd, we'd go build them a loft because the kids throw these lofts away, we'd just save the lumber. And if uh, you needed to go to the fourth floor and use in a wheelchair, not a problem. Close your eyes. We just picked a wheelchair. No up. way. We honestly, we did. Whoa. We did. We had a girl, Amanda Gilprich was her name. She was a staff resident in Warren Hall. Can't tell you the year. We had a big snow. She's parked out in Doomy Woods. 
she couldn't get her truck out. So Nick and I went and scooped it out for her. And she said, well, I don't need it till tomorrow. I said, no, you're moving it today. We made her drive around the block <laughs> and coming back parked it because we scooped it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the lofts are what raise the beds up, is that right? Uh, now, back when when I started, uh, the rooms, I can't tell you the square footage of them. Some, you had a single room, you had doubles, some triples, uh, some with private bath, some with a shared bath, uh, and they'd all go to, <clears throat> excuse me, the lofted beds to get more floor space. And a lot of the, Grandpa's dad's boyfriends, they would build these laws, and the only thing we required was no nails. And they could use drywall screws or carriage bolts, stuff like this. They would build them, use our springs and stuff like that. What was in the room had to stay in the room because we just couldn't make exceptions to move it out. We had no storage. And uh, then we'd go and inspect them to see how safe they were. Uh, I don't know of any of them that I ever rejected, maybe put a gusset on here or there to make it a little more stable. And then a few years down the road, they stopped letting them do their own. We uh, put all new furniture in the five buildings and there was, uh, I think it was a company out of Vermont. The was a Purdue grad, but they built all new furniture for Windsor Hall, which consisted of a bed, a dresser, file cabinet, a desk, and a chair. I think back then it was like 1850 for them items to do one student. So, you know, when you're doing all five buildings, pretty hefty. Well, they decided that with the new furniture the kids still wanted lofts so they went back to the people that made our furniture and they built a tall and a short headboard so that we could use the existing headboards on the beds combine them together and make a tall loft or a short loft hmm. and that that was all good it was time consuming but the thing about it was that and still, I'm sure to this day it happens, is when you have your incoming freshmen come in to pre-register, want to see their room or whatever, you have two or three rooms set up, so display rooms, that's a perfect room. You know, I can put a tall loft in here, it's perfect, or I can put a short loft here, but when these kids see these two rooms, oh, I want the tall loft when you go to the room she's assigned, there is just no possible way. No possible way to do it. And before this way, they used to, all the rooms was painted different colors. And mom, grandma, they'd go, you know, take granddaughter or daughter out and get new bed covered, you know, because we got to be top of the line. And they could come it's back in. We we seen a yellow room, but I'm in a green room. <laughs> we bought stuff to match yellow, but uh, now they just went to the basic all all white, and, which works real well that way. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That the the few weeks before move-in date must have been, or the few weeks during move-in date must have been pretty hectic times. It it started probably. Well, from the day one when all the kids were checked out, <clears throat> seniors got a week uh, to stay in the hall until their graduation. And uh, But like I say, if everybody was checked out of the building on a noon on Sundays, Monday morning, uh, my boss had it down to we'd either strip the floors or scrub the floors. And that's on a rotation basis. So if we were say going to strip one hall the floors we'd go up and we'd move every piece of furniture from one side of the hall to the other oh, side God. and they'd go up and they would do that we'd go move everything over again they'd do the other side and then we'd move it back and then they would come in and do the hallways but the hardest thing was to get 
your summer students, which, you know, I mean, they're going to school, they're going to benefit a lot better than we are, was to understand when this room here, I'm moving over here, I want the big stuff at the doorway. All the small stuff I want back against the wall. Well, why? I said, when this room was completely waxed, we've got with the skates we'd built, we'd set like the dresser on, we'd roll them right over and put them in place. You don't have to move them, you don't have to scratch the floor. So when you do that, you could just come in, you could set this room up that's already done, bring your small stuff from the other side, and do the same way. Well, you know, getting them to buy into that concept, but it, uh, a lot of times if it, you had uh, maybe two days of straight moving, uh, you'd get a little testy. But I, a lot of times I wasn't involved in a lot of the moving. I did my fair share, but I was usually plastering rooms or something like that. Uh, I, uh, I just hated to see a crack in the wall, plaster was old, uh, being rained on. I mean, I just go in and take a wall out. I didn't want a little patch job, but I just take the wall out. And, but they'd usually leave me alone with mm -hmm. that there. But, but you know, sometimes you get caught up. And but I enjoyed the moving. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have no problem because you know always had some help. Uh, had a bunch of tough little girls work there, and had a bunch of weakling boys. But, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 But it was. Did it you, was fun. Did you learn a lot about fixing things when? When you worked at Purdue, or did you bring your knowledge here? I, when I, I've always been the type to tear things apart. I just cannot stand why it does not work or how it works. I don't mm -hmm. care if I bought it brand new. I want to know why it does it. And I've always been pretty good with my hands. And when I went to, like I say, the uh, right out of high school, I got married and went to. Uh, Harrison Steel started out as a electrician apprentice and I did that for probably 10 11 years and then I started doing a lot of the OSHA work out there they hired a guy that was a heating and cooling specialist I worked with him I can do I can do a lot of sheet metal work uh, I can't build your transition or anything like that but I can lay it out uh, not uh, the best carpenter in the world, but I can I can get the job done. It'd take me two days, what would take a carpenter one day to do uh, the plumbing part of it. I was in depth in that quite a bit, and then electrical. Uh, when I started up here, you couldn't get, hardly get anything, but as the years went on down at physical facilities, the crew chiefs, all the guys down there I'd worked with at Harrison Steel, they knew me. If I needed something, I can make a call and get it. Uh, if something needed to be repaired that was like a dish machine or something like this here, I'd just go down to tin shop or welding shop. They'd take care of me because I knew the guys. Yeah, Windsor Hall supplied a lot of coffee for them and a lot of uh, pop, but you know, maybe physical facilities and housing and food service aren't the same division, but they're still Purdue employees. Mm -hmm. And my always theory was, you scratch my back, I'm gonna scratch yours. And I, I live by that motto. And uh, But if there was something that I didn't understand, I knew the guy to call that did. And I had a good working relationship with all of them mm -hmm. that way. Being personable comes in handy, it sounds like. Yeah, well, but you know, I didn't know anybody when I come here, but it, it was big. Mm -hmm. And my theory is, if it's not running and you gotta feed these kids, well then, let's get it fixed. I mean, if it's broke, let's fix it. Well, you know, you kinda learn here, 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 and here. Yeah, I, I raised my voice a few times down there mm -hmm. some of the guys, but when all said and done, uh, I could get about what I wanted. And I could just make a phone call and it would be there and get taken care of and we got along great. Neat. When you started at Purdue, it was Barbara Cook who was the Dean of Students. Do you have any re recollections of her? 
No, I never knew Barbara. The only, probably the oldest person that I remember Purdue would have been Bunny Escher. She was the last house mother mm. that I remember. Uh, I believe she was from Georgia, but I remember Bunny. And she was a house mother. So what did house mothers do back then? I think back then they uh, kind of like handled your discipline like your RLM does now. They, uh, I know Bunny was big into ceramics and I've heard her say many times that if somebody come in with a little bit too much to drink or something like that, she'd make them go to church with her on Sunday uh -oh. and <laughs> go to ceramics. But you know, that was okay. Does she live at the hall? She lived in Dumey. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lived in Dumey. But see, there used to be five staff residents there, or way I understand, five house mothers, but Bunny is the only one that I knew then when she left, they had uh, five staff counselors. And then I think when I retired, we were down to like two, something along in there. And then it got that, that position got overtaken by resident life managers. Is that what RLM uh, means? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that a student position or a staff position? It's staff. And they work, they work at the hall, so they live at the hall? No, they just, uh, maybe they do now, but they didn't then, they just worked there. Okay. Uh, in Vauder, I'll give you an example, when we were back up here, I went up for what used to be the staff resident apartment in Vauder is now like an apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we saw that. Yeah, it's uh, got washer and dryer in it, and they can be married and have children, and I think they do some part of the counseling or something that's on the on the floor there too now and then uh they, a lot of the uh in Doomy hall when i left that was just a big apartment that uh i think parents could maybe like rent it on a weekend instead of going to a motel wow. and it was uh we put in all the really nice uh showers uh everything become pretty much compliant with ADA if we had to in a sense that way, but uh, fully carpeted uh, your uh, internet and your television stuff was right there. And uh, that was, I think they were, you know, if you wanted, you could rent it and say, come down and visit your daughter for the weekend or whatever, mm -hmm. and go from there if you uh, were a spatial needs uh, child or something like that. Uh, they probably make a provision to put you in there uh, in that way. But most generally, you know, when you're like a freshman, you didn't get a single room with your own bath unless you were special needs. Uh -huh. And uh, I've seen that happen a couple, three times. I had one student on kidney dialysis that uh, was in that room and we used to take supplies and stuff up she needed. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, Windsor can offer you everything, and, I, and I, I've been in every res hall that's on campus, and yes, I am partial to Windsor Hall. What makes Windsor Hall so special in your opinion? Uh, I just kind of fell in love with the, with the buildings. They had character and the kids. Uh, Windsor Hall is just a building in itself, and might do, it doesn't really have anything to do with Amelia Earhart. Uh, I did a lot of work in the Amelia Hart room over there. Uh, she is a student, but I don't know. I just, I guess the structure of the building, the way it's designed, and the first place I went, you know, I could probably say, say the same thing if I was at Owen or Meredith, but when I'd go to help somebody in one of these other buildings, which I plastered all over, but I just, there was something about Windsor that, I never wanted to leave. I just had no desire to leave it. I just stayed. Okay. Um. okay. So I'll take over from, now, from here on out. Um, so what did it mean for you personally to be part of Purdue? Like what did it mean? How did it affect you? Well, I looked at it, I really, I enjoyed my time I was here. I 
it was stable. Back when people were losing their jobs, I, like I say, I lost a job that I'd worked 16 years at. Uh, I think I was around 32 years old, uh, buying a home, blah, blah, blah. But when, when I come here, it just was the whole big picture. You know, I mean, I enjoyed the band, I enjoyed the football team, I enjoyed the basketball teams, but the job was going to go nowhere. Purdue was going to go nowhere. I mean, it was all up to me whether I was to leave or not. It was up to me whether I got fired or not. I mean, I I always carried five to six weeks of vacation. I come to work. I'd volunteer to work Sundays. It didn't. I could I could do these eight hours standing on my head because it was not a job to me. It was just something I enjoyed, you know. And uh, but. Uh, I always been a Purdue fan, but uh, yeah, I bleed a little black and gold. But uh, I don't know. But I guess if I had to really do any bragging at all, it'd be I could probably brag on Windsor Hall more than I would Purdue. But I mean, the buildings meant a lot to me. I mean, and I put a ton of work in them. Put a ton of work in them, and you know everything. Uh, the kids. If, well, we had some roof problems a few years ago, and they'd get a lot of water, and ceilings get to fall, and you'd get the roof fixed, but how many kids, uh, some of them really would get irate about it, others, they just, I just move them one side of the room, go in there and plastic table, you know, I just work around them, they didn't have a problem with it, but uh, I don't know, that's, that's just Purdue, you know, I mean, but I, I would never change it. They just like to say I come here and I liked it, so about all I can say. And then at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned war stories. Did you serve, or is this no, still no, no, war no. stories? Nasty, so, okay. yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm not a veteran. No, no, I'm not that. Just stories of kids. Gotcha. And then now this is the last question. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Um, in regards to your time at Purdue, or any topics that you'd like to return to? No, I uh, I pretty much covered everything I'd like to say. I uh, was sitting home. I mean, I sit and I think all the time uh, about this or that. But uh, I remember two girls I had was in the band, Allison and Dana Lawrence. Their dad is uh, he used to be head of Penske Racing Division. And of course, they brought me some Jeremy Mayfield jackets, some other Penske glasses, this and that. But and I was, and I'm not going to tell you the story <laughs> with Allison. But when Ban, I'm telling you, I used to drive her up a wall. But you know, you get, you just get to know these kids. But I mean, I could sit here for hours upon hours and tell you a story about a kid this or a kid that. There's a girl in California. I have not seen or heard from since she left. Her name is Elizabeth Erdman, and she walked in the front door of Warren Hall. Marilyn Silver is still an employee at Windsor Hall. We'll verify this. She walked in, she was crying. She said, Ted, I need a hug. So I gave her a hug, and she went to her room, checked out in summer, and I'll see you next fall. And I've never seen or heard from the girl since. So I don't know if something, you know. A lot of them, you, uh, Jill Summerlot. I remember when Jill come here. She was uh, an extension agent in southern Indiana. She'd been back a couple, three times, but uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, I can sit and tell you a story about every one of them to some degree if you just leave me alone long enough. They put me back at home, let me walk from door to door to door to door. I wouldn't want to tell you the stories on tape, but I would tell you the stories to your face. But, yeah, it's uh, that was very rewarding. Very rewarding. I, I don't have a menace problem with it, none whatsoever. None whatsoever. Well, thank you for sharing your memories. You're more than welcome. <laughs>